Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With us today, Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you. Good morning, Dr. Paul. How are you today? Very good. All right. We're, we're going to talk about a country that you are an expert on. Uh, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> live, live there and work there, and that is the country of Hungary. And Hungary uh, just happens to be a little bit different, so you must have had an influence on them because <laughs> yeah. they're not the average per, average country over there, although they're in the EU and they're in NATO, so uh, they uh, probably just fall in line like the rest. But we find out, as, as with your experience, that they are a little bit different. And uh, we want to talk about that because there's a little meeting going on over there, and the president seems to have his head on right and would maybe think that he could contribute to peace. Mm. Uh, you know, he lives in Europe, and I think all those countries are in Europe, so he's, he's interested in it. But, uh, you know, they, they're having a little meeting over there discussing uh, Hungary's uh, opinion and, and position dealing with Ukraine. Yeah. And uh, Hungary has this really unusual position, you know, for this day. They want peace. They want discussion. Just peace. Just talk about it. Yeah. But uh, I would say that uh, our ambassador sent over there, you know, by our president and hopes that he can contribute to the peace. No, I mean, <laughs> could, could contribute to his uh, responsibilities to the military industrial complex. Yeah. So it, it wasn't so typical of getting, because even when they don't agree, sometimes it's always uh, diplomatic talk. It doesn't sound like they're at each other. But our, our diplomat, our, our ambassador, he did not seem so friendly uh, toward uh, the uh, consideration for just talking to somebody. I mean, yeah. what's what's wrong with that, you know? And uh, I've often argued that, uh, just think of what we won in peace in Ukraine, in, in Vietnam, and what did we lose with the war in Vietnam? Peace is always better than war. That's yeah. my, my very difficult position to come to, but I, that's where I am. But right now, uh, the president uh, of, uh, of Hungary, at least, uh, contributes to a position a little bit challenging to the rest of Europe, and uh, we, uh, we, we applaud him for that, but there's still a ways to go uh, because uh, he, he's probably so much in the minority, and the United States is not on his side, but you know, as, as the empire comes apart and our dollar is undone, who knows what will happen? Maybe Hungary will be a leader in a, a reorganization of what's going on in Europe. But you've had some experience there, and I imagine you know a little bit about this meeting going on. Yeah, I mean, it's just another example. And I think this is probably one of the more egregious examples of the U.S. sending over an activist ambassador. It's not true just only in Hungary, but basically everywhere. That's why U.S. diplomacy fails everywhere, because an ambassador has one job. You go over there and, and you reflect and you tell U.S. foreign policy and explain U.S. foreign policy, and you report back what's going on in the country that you're in. These days, you could actually be replaced by a computer. We don't need ambassadors, and I would argue we should stop having them. But nevertheless, he goes over there from the beginning, and we talked about this on the show before, the moment his feet hit the ground in Hungary, he started lecturing the country, which is one of the things you're not supposed to do. In fact, that goes against the UN Charter, uh, which says that you should respect the sovereignty of other countries. Immediately, he starts lecturing. And so here we had a meeting yesterday uh, of this uh, contact group, the Hungary-Ukraine contact group, and uh, Ambassador David Pressman, we can put that up, and this is our friend Kyle Anzalone in the Libertarian Institute, Institute, he wrote about it. U.S. Ambassador blasts Hungary's call for ceasefire in Ukraine as cynical. Let's put the next one on because this is what happened. This is from uh, Kyle's piece. U. Ambassador, U.S. Ambassador to Hungary, David Pressman, made the remarks during the opening of the Hungary-Ukraine relations panel on Wednesday. Quote, it is cynical to call for a ceasefire when it is not your country that is almost 20% occupied by a foreign invading army. He said, the U.S. wants peace. <laughs> and, and that's, he, he finished the sentence, but I'm going to leave it at that because how is it cynical? Now, Hungary is in a very difficult position because the north, just beyond the northeastern part of Hungary is a uh, area called Transcarpathia, which had been historically part of Hungary for a thousand years. And then after World War I, they got busy redrawing borders, and Hungary lost that whole area with about 150,000 people. So there's, 
the 150,000 ethnic Hungarians living there, many if not most of them have Hungarian passports because they're Hungarians. So Hungary is trying to have a delicate balance where it's calling for peace, but it's refusing the U.S. pressure to send weapons, to allow weapons to be sent to get involved. And it's certainly not on Russia's side. In fact, Hungary has been historically at odds with Russia going back several hundred years. Uh, so unlike, for example, may Serbia, Serbia has a, a long relationship with, with Russia and Bulgaria because they're Slavic brothers. Hungary is different. So trying to be neutral and to carve out that neutral territory and say, let's have some negotiations, that, of course, to an, to an ambassador who believes somehow it's his job to run the show, that is cynical. That's ridiculous. That's uncalled for. You know, when we say jump, you say how high. You know, if they're dealing with this in, in a way that is, is annoying because they're really not talking about that much. Because they're not talking about a peace treaty. They're not talking about divvying up nuclear weapons, any of that. All they're asking is, well, why can't they quit killing each other yeah. for a couple of days yeah. and, and, and get a few people to talk and ask United States ambassadors just stay at home? Yeah, you know? yeah really. And, uh, and then it might not be as messed up. When, when our ambassadors go over there for all this follow-up, you know, it uh, confirms what we've been saying, that this mess, it's, we've been involved for a long time, but especially since 2014, and this is just a little bit of follow-up. They would say, whoa, we've, we've done this, we've gone this far, we just can't give up and we can't let Hungary get away with, you know, uh, ha having a different scenario and they, they can't speak out against our policy. So the ambassador gets off the plane he says why are you guys doing this yeah. you know and then they wonder why they have this failure and uh, i see the combination of a foreign policy that's coming unglued uh for various reasons because we've overreached uh, but we've overspent and we have a financial crisis and now right now we're having a challenge against the dollar yeah. so who knows where hungary is going to be in five years or all of europe for that matter yeah. or uh the united states yeah. because we live in very uh, very difficult times and and uh, they're um, un unpredictable and I think our participation in this meeting is just making things much worse it doesn't fit in any place uh, to non-intervention for us to go over and cause trouble they, they could fit into our beliefs if uh, we offered our assistance to talk peace yeah you yeah. know and, and just go promote it but to go over there I, I, I think uh, can you imagine <laughs> what happens if if you had uh, two people get together or one in China and one in the United States and they and they were the two wanted to have have it but China sends somebody over that gets off the airplane and yeah. bad mouths United States yeah. Yeah. you know yeah. I don't think it would work very well you'd be furious <laughs> well I'm afraid to say ambassador Pressman has an answer to you calling for peace Let's put this next one up. Here's what he thinks about calls for peace. And this is the Radio Free Europe, which is a U.S. government propaganda outlet. He says, when we hear politicians advocate for appeasement masquerading as peace, let's be very clear. One man can make peace today. So, Dr. Paul, I'm afraid you calling for peace really <laughs> means that you're Neville Chamberlain and you want Hitler to win uh, in Europe. So that's basically Pressman's thing. But, you know, this is an ambassador. Just to refresh our viewers, this is an ambassador. I think this must be unprecedented in diplomatic history. He actually paid to rent billboards in the country in which he is a guest of the Hungarian government as a representative of the United States. He took out billboards trashing the government of the country he was stationed in. Let's put this next one up. And this is a magazine called The Hungarian Conservative, which is furious about it. it said the message of the U.S. Embassy sponsored billboards seems to imply that the Orban administration is not in favor of the withdrawal from Russian troops from Ukraine, when Hungary has repeatedly stated its support for Ukraine's territorial identity. And I, I'm not going to read this in Hungarian live, but I can read it. And basically, he's drawing off of the slogan when the Soviets invaded Hungary in 56, said Ruski Kaza, which means Russians go home. He's trying to conflate the two, the 56 uprising and the war in Ukraine, which has been soundly rejected. Let's put this next one on. This is Hungary today by uh, veterans of that uh, 56 uprising and fight for freedom. They were furious. The umbrella organization of the veterans of 56 Hungarian revolution and freedom fight condemned U.S. Embassy funded billboard campaign 
which uses the 56 slogan, Russians go home. In a statement sent to Daily Modyar Nemzet, the public, uh, get the back up, please. The Public Foundation of Freedom Fighters calls on the U.S. Embassy in Hungary, quote, to immediately and permanently cease its daily actions that violate and seek to influence Hungarians' independent political ability to act. So they're saying stop meddling in Hungary. What's happening in Ukraine is nothing like 56. Uh, you know, so they're furious. So the ambassador goes over there and makes a big stink and ruins our relationship with Hungary. You, you know, my first thoughts were the Hungarians are not overreacting, they're underreacting, yeah. and, uh, and yet th th there will be resistance. They're not going to forget about it. You know, somebody might say they, they should have taken care of this immediately, or others would say that, uh, so oh, be, be tolerant and don't, don't start another fight. Yeah. But I don't, th that's not going to happen. And the example I always use is, what if, it did, what if somebody did it to us? You yeah. know, the, Ameri the one thing they do is unite Americans. Remember 9-11 exactly. with all the yeah. controversies that existed with 9-11, and all the truth coming out about 9-11, but immediately the reaction was no Americans were together because it was perceived that somebody came into our country and started killing Americans yeah. and, uh, and we had to get to the bottom. So this kind of thing probably uh, is back backfires on them. Yeah. So often that happens, but they never they never see that unless, unless some idiot along the way says, well, that's what we want. Yeah. We're trying to get them to backfire on them and cause chaos. We need another little war, yeah, potential yeah. war there. I just, if you'll indulge me, Dr. Paul, this, I mean, I think this is U.S. foreign policy in a nutshell. This is an article I found this morning on the Center for European Policy Analysis, which is based in Washington, D.C., <laughs> for some reason. Put this up. This is U.S. foreign policy in a nutshell, this headline. U.S. to Hungary, behave like a proper ally. Oh, Keyword being behave. And so I look up the Center for European Policy Analysis, it seems like they're speaking for some official voices. Let's see who funds them, if we can put that next one up. Oh, it's the U.S. government, <laughs> National Endowment for Democracy, NATO's Public Diplomacy Division, uh, the um, U.S. State Department, the Russia Strategic Initiative of the U.S. European Command. So basically, these are funded by the State Department and the U.S. Pentagon, and they're telling Hungary to behave like an ally. You know, that reminds me of what the Soviets did when Hungary tried to rise up. You better behave or we're going to send tanks in. But you know what somebody should do with that sign is just turn, turn a couple of words. Well, they should be saying, you know, say, behave like an ally yeah, or, exactly. or a pretender of an ally. <laughs> so, and not an invader, yeah. <laughs> not an empire builder. So yeah. but anyway, uh, I guess if we don't hear much more, that means it hasn't gotten worse. But we're going to hear more about that area. That, that, that problem is not going to go away because the more chaos in the world, uh, the more people will be lining up to, uh, they're all lining up to change their boundaries. You know, it's not only Ukraine and the Russians uh, arguing over a boundary of history, yeah. hundreds of years, and dealing with it. And that's the case. And who, who gets upset about the boundaries so much? It's usually, you know, since world, especially since World War I, the boundaries changed in World War I, the boundaries changed in World War II, and they're changing again. And uh, there's not, not a very natural way of doing it, and there's no legalistic way. So, oh, well, we'll have a United Nations. Yeah. And in the United Nations would settle these, these disputes, and, and uh, everybody will have, uh, as Wilson said, the right, everybody has the right to their de own determination, you know, their own sovereignty. And I don't think that's worked out so well. No, <laughs> exactly. Well, before we move on to the second segment, I do want to, again, uh, mention the sponsor of our program for this month, one of our two sponsors, and that's American Financing. We're really excited to have them on board. It's a company that's been endorsed by the, by the, big, the big shots in, in, in uh, broadcasting, Glenn Beck and Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh when he was around. It's a family-owned mortgage lender. They're licensed in all 50 states. They've been in business for 20 years, for over 20 years. Check out their Google reviews to show how people do feel about them. They're doing very well. Uh, they have salary-based mortgage consultants <coughs> rather than uh, incent uh, commission-based. So they're basically interested in getting you the kind of loan you want. They're interested in helping you pay your bills, solve your problems. Who knows, you may even emerge debt-free. Uh, at the very least, they'll save you $100 a month. You never know. So give them a call at 888-976-5055. That's 888-976-5055. 
please tell them that the Ron Paul Liberty Report sent you. Uh, we will have a link in the description to how you can click on. And look, even if you're not looking right now, you don't know that you're looking for some, some debt relief, some mortgage information, just click on that link and check it out and see what they have to offer. It's not going to cost you anything to look and to ask them about what kinds of products they have available. So we thank American Financing for helping us put this show on. Dr. Paul, we're going to move on to number two, which we've been talking about all week. Everyone's talking about Tucker Carlson. I, yes. I clicked in and I was surprised to see him on, on the screen. Yeah, that's right. He was, he was surprised too. I believe I he honestly was. was surprised, you know, <clears throat> that he came up so suddenly. The, um, the experts uh, now are analyzing. Everybody's an expert uh, trying to say what happened. It was all, uh, all Tucker's fault and he deserved this and others are, you know, analyzing it. But we'll, we have a couple, couple people and we're, uh, we want to start with U.S. Army uh, psychological warfare officers to uh, give, them, uh, give us their, his take. At the, and then we're going to follow up with Tucker's, Tucker's answer. And I imagine he had a few people watch his little... Yeah. <laughs> oh I think gosh. probably a bigger audience it was at Fox. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Three or four times as much. So uh, <clears throat> this, this little story on Zero Hedge, a former U.S. Army psychological warfare officer says that Carlson was fired by Fox because of, this is their general lead, regime change, a uh, regime agenda to maintain quote, an uninformed, semi-lobotomized, quasi-retarded <laughs> population. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, those are strong words. I probably wouldn't have used them, but I don't have much complaint about them. Uh, I think, in general, I see it do anything uh, <clears throat> if it's necessary. You have to cancel out the truth. <clears throat> and maybe, maybe Tucker was getting a little bit too too loud about shouting out what the truth was and even if they needed them uh, monetarily that was minor compared to who's controlling the big <clears throat> the, the big story of uh, what the people believe and uh, I think this is why they had to step in they had to stop anybody who's speaking the truth and that's what's been going on uh, you know on the internet quite and they think all we have to do is cancel the truth and cancel the truth yeah. <clears throat> The big thing is you can't cancel truth. All it does, it's sort of like blocking a stream. It just goes around the block and, 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 and continues to flow. So the lies will be there, but you won't be able to cancel the truth. And that's what this individual said, was, was uh, t talking uh, that, uh, that it was the opinion makers that had to be canceled, you know, and, uh, and, 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 and Tucker, Tucker took too much control of that. He became a monopolist. Yeah. Well, there was such a vacuum out there that somebody like uh, Tucker was bound to come around. Uh, but the important issue is what was he talking about? And if, if, if he truly was on the right track of telling the truth, people should pay attention and maybe find out other ways to spread the truth. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> I think this uh, PSYOPs guy had, had some good points, and I think you covered him very well. I mean, uh, that's probably what they do want. He thought outside the box. We didn't always agree with him when we praise him a lot, but you know, we praise people that we don't agree with all the time, you know? <laughs> if they're honest and they tell the truth, certainly a lot of interesting <laughs> things come out. But it was a surprise when he reappeared in his old 8 p.m. time slot. But he wasn't on Fox <laughs> News. He was on Twitter, newly more free Twitter, and he put out a little video. We're not going to show it here because, you know why we're not going to show it here? Because over 17 million people so far have watched that video. That is compared to his 3 million viewers on his uh, daily show normally. So he basically had five times more view just putting out a video on, on uh, Twitter. And it was pretty amazing. We can put on that next clip because I think uh, Zero Hedge captures it well. Tucker reappears in 8 p.m. time slot, but not with Fox, which just suffered a, quote, catastrophic ratings crash. Fox canceling Tucker has been, will go down probably in the history of television journalism as one of the most boneheaded mistakes. Uh, if you care about money, if you care about audience share, I think they may care about something else, the woke agenda or whatever, but of all time. And if you go to the next, um, if you go to the next clip then, uh, they say, um, this is from the article, this is actually, um, uh, from an article about it, he says our current, this is actually what Tucker said in his thing last, in his little thing last night, which was pretty interesting. 
He said, our current orthodoxies won't last. They're brain dead. Nobody actually believes them. Hardly anyone's life is improved by them. This moment is too inherently ridiculous to continue, so it won't. And he went on, and I won't read the rest of it, but he talks about how the system is failing. And here is Sean Davis. I think he's a conservative <coughs> commentator. Uh, if we can put that next one up. Here is a graphic example of what happened to Fox after they cut Tucker Carlson. <coughs> Excuse me. Sean Davis says, Fox News suffered a catastrophic drop in viewers after ousting Tucker Carlson. In the 8 p.m. slot alone yesterday, Fox News lost nearly 50% of total viewers, and within the demographic, 70% of viewers in the demographic compared to last Tuesday. The demo ratings were down across the board, impacting all shows. Now look, it didn't just affect that 8 p.m. time slot, Dr. Paul. It affected the entire network. The Five was down 7%. Special report down 23%. Jesse Waters down 35%. Tucker Carlson slot down 69%, almost 70%. They lost almost three quarters of their audience. Hannity was down a half. As we joked about yesterday, someone said, the only reason people watch Hannity is because they leave the TV on after Tucker's done. <laughs> and then Laura Ingram lost also 20%. So across the board, um, Fox News is being wiped out after doing this. You know, it, <clears throat> this represents a loss of trust. All of a sudden, just like that, something happened mm -hmm. where they no longer trusted the, uh, the station, which is good. This is the pure democracy that is legitimate. It's not the government monopoly. And uh, it's, uh, it, and it's by, you know, the uh, effect of this was very bipartisan. Ordinarily, uh, Tucker's, they say, was reaching, you know, conservatives and Republicans and uh, that sort. But because it was such big news, 17 million people. <clears throat> so this is an example of the whole thing backfiring. They yeah. wanted to, they want to stop the truth coming out, and they draw 10 times more attention to it, and they introduce it to probably the enemies of the people who want to get rid of it. So now that people are looking at, maybe maybe they'll look more at the military industrial complex and the pharmaceutical uh, industrial complex, and, and who knows, they might even say, who else is saying some of these things? Oh, RFK sort of yeah. talks like this too. So it, <clears throat> it will and has backfired, and uh, I, I think it's another example that <clears throat> while you know, this episode with Bud Light was supposed to be punishment. Yeah. And that that worked against him, too. The people who were going to preach their gospel. And all of a sudden, uh, this effort to lock, in, lock uh, Tucker out, yeah. you know, has totally backfired and probably gave him a much big, bigger microphone. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that <coughs> they were upset that a lot of Republicans were, were watching. But, you know, the point made yesterday, which I think that make, makes them even more upset, is that more registered Democrats watched Tucker Carlson than watched all of CNN. So he had a broad <coughs> appeal. He wasn't, we talked about it yesterday, he wasn't divisive like they said. In fact, he had people like Jimmy Dore on, like Glenn Greenwald all the time was on there. Uh, RFK Jr. was on there. He had a lot of progressives, and there still is that core in the Democratic Party, I think, that has those views, and they were watching Tucker because you're not going to see RFK Jr. on MSNBC unless it's to be pilloried. The same with Glenn Green Greenwald. Greenwald, he's treated terribly there. So he had a broad appeal, and I think that was a real danger. And I think a lot of people, it looks almost like a conspiracy because a lot of them are saying the same thing because they're finding bad things to say about Tucker. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure they can find tidbits there that they can <laughs> they can use to uh, give him a challenge. But it's it's sort of a form of character assassination. We can't, we can't beat him on the issues. We can't beat him on saying he's not telling the truth unless we destroy his character and that he's untrustworthy. But just think, like I've already mentioned, how Fox undid their, 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 their trust factor. Yeah. Their trust factor went away with lightning speed. No so uh, that's why, uh, you know, all these things, when they're artificial, whether it's our artificial economy, artificial empires, uh, artificial debt pro proliferation, all these things, they can end very, very rapidly. And in this day and age, you know, you don't even have to get it on the main street media. Yeah. <laughs> that's not where people heard this. It was all on the internet, and that's where they go. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and that's why <clears throat> a number 
at Fox went down. Yeah, I think he's got. <clears> and the media, uh, so, uh, social media went up. Yeah, I think he's got a huge future. Whatever he wants to do, <laughs> uh, he's going to be successful. But before we do our final show, which I know is something that's very uh, near and dear to your heart uh, and your interest <coughs> in some work that you've been doing lately. Um, we do want to talk to up top about our other sponsor for this month, and that's 4 They've been with us for a few months, and we're very grateful to have them support this show and make us able to do what we do. Uh, they're talking about the problems with our power grid. You know, in January, there was the third time that a power station in North Carolina was damaged by gunfire. They must be doing a lot of stuff out there in North Carolina, but it's not that funny because it's a huge threat. They've, been, they've identified nine key substations that if they are knocked out for whatever reason, Power can be knocked out from coast to coast for up to 18 months. It's hard to imagine. I, I know I've been in blackouts, Dr. Paul. You have too. We're in hurricane country. Losing power for a couple of days without a generator is a nightmare. But months, I can't even imagine it. The folks at 4 have some great solutions, including the Patriot Power Generator 2000X. It's a solar generator. It's not for your whole house. It's for the vital items that you need. Refrigerator, some medical devices to keep your phone up and running. These are things that you need for a long term and you can take it with you where you go. If you enter Ron in, you will get your 10% discount going to 4 There is a link to where you can find this and other great products that 4 has available to help you prepare for the worst. Um, you can get your free shipping of course on all orders over $97 and get it there right away. And a portion of every sale is donated to charities to support our veterans and their families. So they do try to do good. So go over to 4 get yourself a generator. Dr. Paul, we're going to talk a little bit about religion. Let's put this Well, we, yeah. we'll qualify the word re little religion, faith, but faith, faith, faith and yeah. religious belief. And uh, it's not uh, narrowed down to Christianity, anything. The, the issue here is what do young people respond to the principle the idea of a higher power that is probably a creator yeah. and God is what they're talking about and they have done a recent uh, survey and they found an is a steady increase on the age group 18 to 25 yeah. so those young people who are always put into one category and you know they all act the same you know this sort of thing and I, I tell you I uh, have been exposed to a few young people, and I don't do that because uh, I, I think the young people are very open-minded to different things. And this is saying that young people, because they've looked at COVID, they've looked at uh, perpetual war in Ukraine, and what they're facing, facing with inflation, and they're shifting over. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not super huge, but it's significant. Uh, in 2021, it was one-fourth of them uh, agreed that, you know, there, there is a higher power. Uh, and, and that's just shifted to now, uh, you know, uh, one, one and three yeah. are, are, are uh, <clears throat> thinking about these things. And I think that's the issue of all of history is good versus evil and, uh, and, and believing in creation. And there's a lot, every religion deals with it to a degree. And it's even, even that, that whole issue has been around uh, even uh, in recorded history, even before Adam and Eve, you yeah. know. So they've been dealing with this. And uh, I find it very interesting because uh, uh, it's, it's been a perpetual debate going on. It's more so than ever. The young people are ahead of the uh, the older group of people who don't change their, their minds very often. But I th I think it's good. I think it's good because the, the the contest I see is the belief in uh, you know a, a higher power, a higher law. Uh, versus what do the other people believe? And I put them in the category that they don't believe. Yeah. Many of them are advocates and uh, are very dedicated to the principle of nihilism. And, you know, Nietzsche established this whole thing that you can't know the truth. Quit talking about it. You, there's no, nobody can know the difference between right and wrong. But I just happen to think that's still around and uh, we can't just dismiss it. And these young people are starting to do it. And this does, does not mean that there's a monopoly on it, which may uh, offend some people because I think there's a lot of variation. But I think it's been, this history has been pervasive even before, uh, bef before Christianity and way back, and it's a natural thing, it's built into our system, and that uh, most, uh, uh, most societies have 
I've always endorsed it, not agreed upon it, but then uh, the, the, the system that we have today, almost all religions, now, how many religions, uh, uh, you know, talk about, uh, you, you know, sacrificing sacrificing babies like they did in Mexico yeah. a thousand years, and yet they're sacrificing life at times, sometimes uselessly in war and some of the social problems that we have. So I, I find it fascinating that there is a shift and, uh, and some have, and the dates fit, that, that the frustration that everybody felt with the insanity of the lockdowns yeah. of COVID. And instead of accomplishing, squelching all this, and people would argue, well, the kids are just gonna get into trouble and all that. It may have, uh, you know, let something else. Maybe, maybe there has been an honest turn in the interest of a higher authority and a higher law. Yeah, and we wanna just put up, this is the article we're talking about it's from the <coughs> Wall Street Journal. If you can put that up, it's the one with the praying hands. There we go. Wall Street Journal, I think it's today. Um, the surprising surge of faith among young people. Uh, it's worth a read. You've covered all the details. It's up from one in four to one in three who believe in a higher power. Uh, let's hope that that continues because as you've always said, Dr. Paul, we can't be a self-governing society if we're not a moral society. And if this represents a turn to return to morality, then I think we should all be for it. But I'm going to finish, if you're done, Dr. Paul, with uh, another reminder. And if you look at this next clip on the, this final clip exactly, on, the, uh, on today's thing. This is for our June 3rd conference. We still have some tickets. We want to get you out there. They lie. Nihilism in the war on truth. And Dr. Paul has just talked about Nietzsche and nihilism. Uh, we're going to talk about that. But we're also going to talk a lot about what's happening in current events within that context. It's always uh, a good show. It's always good people. Uh, right now, we've got, um, we've got some, uh, some great speakers lined up. We'll, we'll probably uh, let you know in the next day or two. We're just in a final discussion with a couple of them. But go to RonPaulInstitute.org or go into the description under the show. Click on and get your tickets. And while you're clicking around, click like and click subscribe to our channel here. We thank you for viewing. Over to you, Dr. Paul. Very good. I'm going to close by just making another comment about natural law because that's what we're referring to. And uh, nat natural law is something that uh, many over the many, many centuries have accepted. And uh, it's thrown around and sometimes carelessly used. But uh, <coughs> I happen to believe that uh, there is such a thing as right and wrong, good and evil. And it's not that difficult to uh, figure it out. Uh, but when you reject it outright, which many have, and they still do, and they're still probably in the majority, and say, well, uh, that's too confusing uh, to talk about, and uh, we don't know that. What happens if you reject natural law, then you create a vacuum, because there's such a powerful determination by all individuals and in all cultures to have something to believe in. So the, the vacuum has to be filled right now uh, for the last 100 years or so. The vacuum has been filled by uh, a Marxist approach, you know, total t totalitarianism, where the state and the party dictates right and wrong. And the contest is between those who believe in, in a higher law and natural law versus those who say, ain't such a thing around. So we're the law. It's arbitrary. And guess who most likely will want to fill that position? People who are filled with evilness and, and lying doesn't hurt. Just think of our culture today. Just think of our political system in the United States. It's filled with lies. And I think uh, uh, Tucker even you know, put, put that in his statement. It's just filled with lies. But I think people wake up and I think that's what we're seeing now. And I think it's gonna be beneficial in spite of all the very negative things and the fear mongering going on because I have all those concerns. But I also believe that the only thing that we have left is a, a nonviolent approach to telling people that there is such a thing as natural law and you should not resort to some type of a nihilism and then opening up the door to authoritarianism. That is the wrong way to go. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon.